Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of adaptation, climate adaptation webinars. Uh, we're very pleased to start um, the climate risk and vulnerability at the nexus of equity, health, and public works planning um, in just a moment here. All participants are in listen-only mode. Um, the GoToMeeting platform offers you a control panel on the upper right-hand corner of your screen, and you will use that dialogue um, to access uh, outlines that we have, the handouts that we have, ask questions please using the question box. Um, we will of course have a recording of this webinar and all of the handouts will also be available at the Mayor's Caucus website where you signed in for this. Um, and then just a note, we use an interactive uh, platform called Mentimeter. So if you have a moment now, if you would go to menti.com on your smart device, and uh, open that platform up. And then when we get to a slide that um, we'd like your input on, or question we'd like your input on, we would ask you to enter a code and then you can participate with the rest of the, um, the rest of the attendees in this webinar. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn it over to Chairman of our Environment Committee, Mayor Kevin Burns. Thank you, Edith, and happy Friday to you all. Good afternoon and welcome to our third in a series of workshops designed to help all of us develop priorities and strategies to adopt to climate changes and their impacts, and of course, to be more resilient, both as a region and within our own respective communities. We are working on a regional climate plan with the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy in partnership with International Urban Cooperation Program. Our plan will include both climate mitigation strategies reducing greenhouse gases, and adaptation strategies. And while we all have an expansive foundation for our plan, we must have strong local participation. We need and we welcome the input of our community leaders in the development of this plan. And especially, we need all of our 275 member communities of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus to help us implement the plan, especially the 131 cities and multiple counties that have already adopted the Greenest Region Compact. This session today will bring the community perspective to our planning process. And that perspective, of course, will focus on the important, the necessary, and the urgent issue of equity. It's my pleasure to welcome my fellow mayors to this community panel and to welcome the experts in planning public works, and public health who support local governments in all they do. To begin, we're going to review our Steps to Resilience, the tool that is guiding our resiliency planning. We are grateful for the assistance of Jim Fox and Dr. Ned Gardner and the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit throughout these webinars. And now, just a brief introduction of both our speakers. First, Mr. Jim Fox. Mr. Fox is a senior resilience analyst for NEMAC and Fernleaf, a public-private partnership between an applied research center at the University of North Carolina, Asheville, which he leads and has led for 15 years, and a private company specializing in community resilience solutions. He has worked with Dr. Gardner to create the Climate Resilience Toolkit and Steps to Resilience. And he has worked with many municipalities and regions to build their climate resilience plan. And of course, our friend, Dr. Gardner. Dr. Gardner is a special analyst, excuse me, spatial analyst, ecosystem scientist, data visualizer, and science communicator dedicated to helping people understand and apply global change information to better decision-making. By aiding and documenting the process of adaptation, he is helping define how our nation adapts to a changing climate system. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our friend, Mr. Jim Fox. Thank you very much, Mayor Burns, appreciate that. Ned, you can advance to the next slide. Uh, for those of you that have been with us the past two weeks, you know, we've been talking about resilience and then the relationship between climate hazards and things we care about. So last week we had some experts talk to us about climate and the main stressors for our region. And then we could see how those lead to these hazards and hazards then impacting assets. These are people, buildings, 
livelihoods in our neighborhoods. And so as we go to the next slide, we also then talked about what are some of the largest impacts for our region sitting through here for uh, the greater Chicago region. And you can see that the first one, heat and health, how the uh, heat is impacting people. Then you can see that the next three, what we call impact pairs, have the same hazard of flooding. But we do notice that they will be impacting, flooding will impact homes very differently than infrastructure or businesses. So as we go to the next slide, we can actually see that we are working our way through a risk framework. And a risk framework uh, just gets us to move from data to decisions. And we explored hazards and climate last week. What we're going to be looking at today is the concept of vulnerability and risk and asking ourselves the question, can we accept the vulnerability and risk that we're experiencing to the things we care about in our towns and neighborhoods? As a reminder, we can look at a simple slide. Here's two buildings. Both are located in a floodplain. That means that they are equally exposed to flooding. But if you're wanting to live or work or own one of these buildings, which would you choose? We can see that one of the buildings, the one on the left, has a much greater vulnerability than the one on the right because the living area and a business is located much lower in elevation. So we then think about this uh, in a special mental model. And that's shown on this next slide about how we move from this concept of exposure, shown on the upper left, to vulnerability. That when we look at an asset that is exposed, we can then look at the concept of sensitivity. Sensitivity is a high level of concern of anything that we value that might be more critical than others. And combining sensitivity with exposure, we get potential impact. Going down the other branch of this tree, we look at adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity really means a greater ability to cope with impacts. Adaptive capacity is high if an asset will experience minimum interruption due to flooding or some similar hazard. Adaptive capacity is low, though, if there is going to be a large interruption or a high cost due to that threat. So to explore this concept together, we're all going to go on to minty.com together. And I'm going to let Ned lead us through this very brief exercise. Hi, everybody. So at this point, please do use your smartphone, your iPad, another tab in your browser, go to menti.com and enter this code 97, 99, 25, and you'll be prompted to um, answer this question here. We've already had one very eager participant jump in and um, answer the question. And we've, we've posed a question. Um, for three different cases, do these represent low sensitivity or high sensitivity? So the first one deals with a basement that's frequently flooded and persistently has mold. So if you lived there, um, would you be experiencing high sensitivity? If you had a basement that rarely flooded but had good indoor quality in that home, would you consider that low sensitivity or high sensitivity in other words that flood would it disrupt your life if your household income is in the bottom third for the region of chicago would you think you'd be more sensitive to flooding and its impacts or less sensitive and so that's what we're asking in this question so most people are, are uh, gravitating toward the idea that your sensitivity is higher if you have fewer resources to adapt, if you have fewer resources, and if you're uh, going to experience impacts from the flooding. Frequently, your basement floods, and maybe you have mold in your house and it's affecting indoor air quality. And just for contrast, if, you're, if your home doesn't flood and you have good indoor air quality, well, then flooding may not be something you personally are very sensitive to. Defining these rule sets is very important for, um, for leaders and for uh, 
people developing an action plan because we need to be able to understand the number of people who are impacted by hazards in order to assess the vulnerability in your community to um, that hazard. So this is a, a little insight into how we would uh, quantify sensitivity. Similarly, we can think about adaptive capacity and I've tried to keep it fairly straightforward. Um, consider a building with no flood proofing, the hot tamale shack on the left that, uh, that, <clears throat> that Jim pointed out, or a building with flood proofing. So maybe it's been elevated so that the living area is not in the floodplain. So these are contrasting cases. And um, we've got about 15 people having participated. And the weight seems to be that uh, with no flood proofing, um, your adaptive capacity is low. And with flood proofing, your adaptive capacity is higher. So we're really getting at um, whether the event itself would cause a disruption or not. So there may be a little bit of confusion around terminology. That's natural. But we work through those things in defining rule sets that, that we can then apply uniformly throughout the region to help you develop a plan. With that, I'll, I'll come back to you, Jim. Thank you, Ned. And as you can see, as Ned's explanation was going through there, what we're trying to do is establish rule sets, ways to quantify sensitivity and adaptive capacity, and rule sets that are very transparent and that everybody can understand. So if we look at some of the biggest risks for our area, one of those is heat and health, which we're gonna hear quite a bit more about later today. And we can see that sensitivity rule sets are gonna be pertaining to things like demographics or age, or even some respiratory or cardiovascular health uh, impacts, maybe even a type of dwelling, or the concept of a heat island, that if you live in a concrete jungle with no trees around, that that would be a much hotter area to live. Adaptive capacity rule sets would be, well, you know, how can you cool the structure or the person? Or, you know, are there trees in your neighborhood? And just as important, social and neighborhood support. Are there people around that are going to be taking care of you as well, too? Going to the next slide, we saw that we started then quantifying this for our region. And you can see that CMAP provided us with a map of where the urban heat islands are much more prevalent, you know, where a lot of the concrete is going to be causing a much higher heat in the neighborhood. And this is due to some impervious services and dark services. As we go to the next slide, I want to show you an example about how all this can come together. Ned and I live in the state of North Carolina, and this was a study that we did for the cities of Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. You can see this is a four county region. The smaller blocks are broken out or census tracts, or a better way to think about it is neighborhoods. The first map is showing levels of sensitivity. The darker areas on the map shows where uh, an area where there are both high sensitive populations and a high amount of developed land cover. In other words, a lot of that concrete jungle. A medium area, the medium color, looks at one or the other. You either have high sensitive populations or a lot of this concrete jungle. The lower one is where neither one prevails. And you can see importantly then that you don't get a single color across the entire metro area, that it is variable. If we look at the next map that looks at rule sets for adaptive capacity, we can again see similar things, that where we start seeing high areas of tree canopy, that that is giving us that ability for high adaptive capacity, where very few trees is low. Well, you combine the two of those, as we saw in the diagram before, and you get the following map, which is a map of vulnerability. High sensitivity, low adaptive capacity yields high vulnerability. The areas, the neighborhoods that are shown up with the darker colors have a much higher vulnerability than the others. Let's see another example of the next slide. This is flooding in homes. You can again see sensitivity and adaptive capacity rule sets here. Again, very easy to quantify and to be able to you know, compare one home to another uh, across the metro region. Going then to the next slide, we can see how this can be applied. That this was a map again that CMAP showed us where the flood susceptibility, you know, 
what areas are more likely to flood, which is a risk concept, and then the next slide, which looked at the idea of vulnerability, and especially social vulnerability, that the idea of the communities that have less resources and how they could be impacted by this as well too. Well, going on to the final and next slides, we can see that this type of quantification can occur at single building and parcels, that moving from a series of maps from exposure to sensitivity and finally to vulnerability, we can see which buildings, which businesses, which homes are much more vulnerable at even a local scale sitting through here. So Ned, if we'll just go on then, I do want to remind people that vulnerability combines with risk for a total vulnerability and risk score. And this is a slide from our first session, just reminding us that the two highest risks for the Chicago region are extreme heat and flooding. With that, we'll go to the slide and just ask ourselves, can you accept the vulnerability and risk that climate presents to your assets? If not, then we need to assess that and really get a quantification. Mayor Burns, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Fox, and thank you, Dr. Gardner. As we pivot, we're going to have the pleasure of hearing from a distinguished panel of elected officials and experts to help us address climate mm -hmm. risks and vulnerabilities as we see it in our communities and as we experience it in our communities. Joining the panel, are a number of folks who I have the pleasure of just getting to know, and I trust that you will also enjoy their perspective. So please allow me to introduce to you our very first speaker, the Honorable President of the Village Board of Hazelcrest, Bernard Alsbury. President Alsbury is in his second term as the Village President of Hazelcrest. He previously served as Village Trustee beginning in 1999. He is the immediate past president of the Southland Regional Mayoral Black Caucus and was president of the South Suburban Mayors and Managers Association for two terms. He serves on the executive board of the Metropolitan Mayors Caucus as well as South Suburban Land Back Development Authority, South Southwest United Way, and Advocate South Suburban Hospital Governing Council. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable President Alsbury. Thank you so much, Kevin, uh, for that great introduction. I wrote it very well. Yes, you did. I'm glad you to read it. <laughs> well, um, the, the uh, initial presentation really uh, del delves right into uh, what I would like to present. And uh, let me turn over the... Hazelcrest is a Southland community of uh, approximately 13,000. Uh, 900 uh, residents. Uh, median income is uh, around 54,000. Uh, complementary to Cook County, which is around 59, 59,000. Our community, as we deal with climate change, and, and as, as you've seen from the introduction, uh, the village of Hazelcrest has a older, majority older population, uh, which are most vulnerable residents are our seniors, uh, many of whom have lived in Hazelcrest now for over 30 years. Uh, uh, analysis of the health outcomes confirm that older people and young children are the most likely to suffer health problems from heat. Uh, as the climate changes uh, happen, as we see more days in the summer of hot, very extreme heat, there is evidence that the impact of exposure to heat are variable in the United States, depending on how well housing structures are and how communities have accommodated to help to the hot climate conditions over time. A large percentage of homes in Hazelcrest are over 25 years old, and many of them do not have the last, latest high efficiency air conditioning units, good quality insulation, upgraded windows to keep out the heat. And for many, their income status does not allow these upgrades because we do have a lot of retirees who are on a fixed income. What we found uh, in, in the past years is when we have huge heat waves that come about, we have we, we've developed uh, 
cooling centers where we actually uh, ask our seniors to uh, go to in times of severe heat. We also try to monitor what they're doing. So the their vulnerability is great in, in the village of Hazelcrest. Uh, also to go along with that is a lot of times when we tell individuals to go to uh, our cooling centers, a lot of them socially are isolated and are, are not really involved a lot in the community. So we actually do have to make phone calls and knock on doors to make sure that they're uh, safe within their home. Uh, Heat related illnesses among older people uh, is a great concern for us. Uh, as we've seen during 1995, when you had a lot of seniors in Chicago who did not talk to their families a lot, uh, they did not know they even had air or they felt that they couldn't afford to run the air. And, uh, and we had a lot of uh, seniors who had who passed because hot, the home became so, so hot that they uh, could not handle it and uh, were not drinking a lot of the fluids and, and that social isolation for family and friends. Uh, and we lost a lot of individuals during that time. We've experienced a lot, some of that in Hazelcrest also, uh, but we, what we're trying to do to, uh, to help them is actually, again, uh, develop ways that we can keep tabs on them. We have a, uh, we do register our seniors now and actually make healthy phone calls uh, during the times that we have really, really severe heat. To go along with that, uh, when we talk about heat, we also, sometimes the heat problem that we have in South South is also air quality. I know that's not on the slide, but we talk about the air quality. We have a lot, a lot of a high incidence for our analysts with asthma because a lot of them have problems with breathing due to, to uh, allergies or just due to uh, healthcare conditions of, uh, that they, under, from under their control. So we find that, that the air quality problems is, is huge in our, our area. Um, that is also because of pollution that we see we found in the Southland over years of landfills and other things, and also because of some of the crossroads that go through our communities. Uh, we have 80 and 294, so we have a lot of uh, trucking and uh, motor vehicles going in out of there, out of our area. Also, you know, we have pre existing conditions with a lot of our seniors. So, uh, when we talk about the heat uh, index in our area, we also are worried about are they actually taking their meds so they that they, they, they don't get ill. Uh, they all uh, the ones who may have uh, heart disease or lung disease trying to follow them also. And the heat just increases that problem they may have and, and staying healthy within their home. So you know the combination of heat, the combination of air quality is a extreme. Uh, uh, threat to our, our seniors within our community and our, our younger uh, citizens within the village of Hazelcrest. And as we move on to flooding, which has been a huge problem in the Southland region, uh, we have, uh, and it has been a problem for many, many reasons. Uh, some of our homes and, and the piping within the south suburbs is, is old. We have some parts of our community who have clay piping where we have sometimes when you have a lot of water, they tend to collapse because they cannot handle the uh, increase of, of water coming through them. Uh, and as many of you know, the last two years, uh, we've had some torrential rains in our area. And uh, we are, uh, our pipe is unable to handle that much water at one time. So we've had an increase in flooding, especially in our older parts of our community, also in some parts of the community that we've really never had issues before because of the amount of water that's coming in. Uh, some of this, uh, as I said before, is due because the, the piping is older. And what we found also is that we may have a, a two inch pipe coming from the house to drain the water off. But like when you go into the street, the pipes are smaller one inch and then the water can't, it can't handle the water that's coming in. So we have flooding in our streets, a lot of times flooding in the backyards. And a lot of our flooding from the backyards happens because as residents move into the area also, they change the grading. Uh, they may want to make the yard nicer. Uh, they may want to put some ornaments in their backyard, or they may want to put a basketball court or something in the backyard for, for the children to play with. But when they change that grading, it also promotes flooding because the way that homes were designed for the water to run off, off into the creeks, because we have many creeks out here. 
so the water doesn't pool and flood. As they change that, we, found, we find more and more and more homes uh, that are beginning to flood in our area. Uh, and for, like I said earlier, many, many reasons, changing the grading, but also uh, the amount of water coming at one time. Uh, recently, we had some rains uh, a couple of weeks ago where we've had uh, increased flooding also. So as we try to work toward uh, taking care of this problem because of the vulnerability of the flooding for our older homes, uh, we find that it has been a, a problem. And I just had a, a resident the other day complaining about the older part of town where they had some increased flooding uh, that she's more she's seen in the 20 years that she's lived here. So it's become a, a major, major problem. And also we find that because of Hazelcrest is surrounded by a lot of creeks, we have a lot of uh, creek erosion. Uh, we, have a, we have a bridge that we have that connects one part of our community to a, another. And just because sitting on a creek and all the water that's uh, rushing in under the support of the bridges, you, have, you start seeing the erosion of the bridges. And uh, we, have, we have to re replace uh, some of the support beams that sit on the creek. This also affects our streets. Uh, unable to uh, replace them sometimes at a time because of the, uh, the water running under a bridge. If we replace the, the street itself, within no time, uh, we have again potholes and some the streets begin to kind of uh, crack and, and they need to be replaced. But this is a huge problem throughout the Southland. Some of the uh, ways that we're addressing some of this area is actually uh, having more tree and open space as, as a solution. We have been working a lot of mitigations to uh, in our woodland area where we actually are uh, working to develop uh, dry wells. Uh, we do some power raking and our compo compost to actually absorb some of the water that's coming there in the runoff. Uh, we also, as far as the heat concern, uh, our open lands area had we plant many many variety of tree, tr trees in the region in our air in our area which has helped we're hoping to help cool off our region as you've seen from the slides previously where they're talking about when you just have uh, no tree uh, no no uh, covering and which is also actually increased their your heat index in, in your region so we're working really with our open lands uh, crew a uh, car person who actually uh, is our expert Arborist out here in Hazelcrest uh, works with us quite often and to help us uh, develop a strategy to not only deal with the flooding but also deal with the increased heat uh, by actually providing us some covering and some soft spots in the village of Hazelcrest. So with that, uh, I finished my presentation and I want to thank you very much and I hope that was some help to all of us. Mayor Aldbury, thank you very much. A huge help, and we appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is Elena Grossman. Elena is the program director for Building Resilience Against Climate Effects in Illinois, otherwise known as BRACE Illinois. BRACE Illinois is a partnership between the University of Illinois at Chicago School of Public Health and the Illinois Department of Public Health which helps to prepare Illinois for the health effects from climate change. Elena holds a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish and International Relations from Franklin and Marshall College and a Master of Public Health and Community Health Sciences from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Please welcome Elena Grossman. Hi everyone, thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm actually going um, Mayor Alsbury talked about um, some health effects from climate change, and I'm going to go into more detail about them. So many of you are probably aware that many people think of glaciers and polar bears when they think of climate change. And we in the public health community are really trying to shift that conversation to humans and health because we care about our health. And there are a number of impacts on health from climate change. This is an infographic that the CDC Climate and Health Program created showing how 
Climate change is impacting a number of environmental conditions, causing them to become more frequent and more severe. And those environmental conditions are leading to a plethora of health effects throughout the world. I'm going to focus on the health effects of most concern in Illinois, which include heat stress, respiratory health, all the public health implications from floods, vector-borne diseases, and mental health. But before I do that, it's important to note that at baseline, not everyone has the same opportunity to be healthy for a number of factors. And this is being exemplified with the coronavirus pandemic where the African-American community is being disproportionately impacted by the virus. And we are learning more and more that our zip code is a better predictor of our health than our genetic code. So where you live really impacts your health. One way to look at this is through life expectancy. The Virginia Commonwealth University Center on Society and Health looked at life expectancy in different locations in different cities based on public transportation. And so you're currently looking at the city of Chicago. And if you look at the loop, the life expectancy is 85 years. And if you go south, it's 69 years. That's a 16 year difference in between two locations in the same city that are about eight miles apart. And if we look at the suburbs, we see a similar disparity. This is from Loyola University Medical Center's Community Health Assessment, and they looked at uh, data from 2016. So in 2016, the life expectancy was about 79 years. And you can see that at the top, River Forest, their life expectancy was close to 86 years. And you can see the, the difference all the way down to Broadview, which was closer to 72 years. Another way to look at how where you live impacts your health is through social vulnerability. Um, this is an index called the Socio Needs Index, and it uses many different socioeconomic indicators to measure the socioeconomic needs of the population which correlate with poor health outcomes. So a value of zero indicates low need and a value of 100 indicates high need. And you can see that Hazelcrest is, has a higher need uh, category. And again, this is from a community needs health assessment of the Advocate South Suburban Hospital. So moving into the actual health effects, um, I'm gonna start with heat. The image that you're looking at is from the 95 Chicago heat wave, which Mayor Alsbury also referenced. It killed over 700 people. The Cook County Coroner's Office was so overwhelmed with unclaimed bodies that they had to create mass graves, and that's what you're looking at. This image looks more like an image from a war-torn country, not from the city of Chicago uh, for after a heat wave. And that heat wave was also another example of how disasters really exacerbate equity and inequity issues in that communities with high African-American populations had the highest fatality rates, and these were the same communities with high crime rates and low income per capita. And heat is actually the most fatal of all weather-related disasters. This is from the National Weather Service and it's looking at fatalities of a number of different natural disasters um, from 2018, a 10-year average and a 30-year average. And for all three categories, heat has the highest fatality, um, has the highest fatalities. Heat is silent. You can't see it like you can see a flood or like you can see a tornado or a hurricane, but it's deadly. And when we're talking about heat illnesses, we're talking about a spectrum. So starting with heat rash, heat cramps, they're the most benign. Many of you may have even experienced them. Moving to heat exhaustion, heat syncope, and finally the most fatal of heat stroke, where your body can't cool itself down anymore. So a key symptom is actually not sweating, since sweating is how our body cools itself down, and this can lead to organ failure. And an important note as it relates to heat is how our communities are built can impact the temperature. So urban areas that have a lot of concrete, a lot of asphalt, a lot of black asphalt, more cars, less green space, and, and fewer trees, the temperature can be five to seven degrees warmer in urban areas compared to non-urban areas. So moving to floods, we in Illinois are very familiar with floods, uh, and there are a number of public health implications from floods. Mold um, from flooded homes that can cause respiratory health problems waterborne diseases, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide, injuries and fatalities that can happen when you're preparing for the flood during the actual event and then after cleaning up, and then mental health, which I'm going to talk about as its own health challenge. 
So the majority of all waterborne disease outbreaks that happen in the United States happen after extreme precip precipitation events. As many of you are well aware of, our stormwater management systems become overwhelmed during these events. Um, sewage can get into drinking water sources and that can then, um, that then travels to the drinking water treatment plants, but those treatment plants can become overwhelmed as a result of such a high amount of water. And this can happen in both rural and urban areas. Respiratory health. Here in Illinois, there are two main ways that climate change is impacting respiratory health. One is that we're seeing more allergens in the air and longer allergy seasons. So the image that you're looking at is showing a change in length of ragweed season between 1995 to 2015. Each dot represents how much longer or shorter the season has become over that 20 year time period. So if we look at Southern Wisconsin as a proxy for Northern Illinois, we can see that the ragweed season became 15 days longer during that 20 year time period. We have shorter winters, earlier springs, longer falls. That means a longer growing season. And you couple that with more precipitation and pollen producing plants just prosper. And the other way is more ozone pollution. Ozone pollution is a chemical reaction of pollutants that come from cars and factories with heat and sunlight. And so the key variable in this equation as it relates to climate change is heat. Higher temperatures means a higher ozone pollution concentration. Ozone pollution is particularly harmful to those with any sort of respiratory health condition like asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And it can also be unhealthy for those even with healthy lungs. Uh, our friends, the ticks and mosquitoes, um, we're seeing an expanding geographic range of vectors. So ticks and mosquitoes are able to live in places they couldn't live before because it's becoming warmer. So if you look on the, on the map, the, these two maps show number of cases of Lyme diseases. Uh, the map on your left is from 2001. The map on your right is 2018. If you look at Illinois, you can almost count how many dots there are in 2001, but by 2018, you can't. They'd spread north, south, and west. And we're seeing this increasing trend in Illinois as well. This is over a 10 year time period. You can see that increasing trend line in number of cases. And rising temperatures are also allowing ticks to be able to survive, more ticks to be able to survive winters. Higher okay. temperatures are also changing the life cycle of ticks <clears throat> and mosquitoes, as well as increasing the biting rate. So mosquitoes bite more frequently in hotter temperatures. And again, with shorter winters, earlier springs and longer falls, the season for ticks and mosquitoes is becoming longer. Kendall County Health Department found nine ticks in a forest preserve in February a few years ago. February has never been considered a tick, a, a tick season. Finally, mental health. So for mental health in Illinois, we're most concerned about floods. Floods lead to property damage. There's the loss of property. There's the loss of personal items and the loss of, um, and the financial stress. Um, and, you know, in after Hurricane Katrina, they saw that five to eight months after the month, they looked at a number of different mental health conditions. A year later, they all increased over time to the point where 17, 12 years later in 2017, they were still seeing cognitive disability and memory loss and coined the term Katrina brain. So an important point about health effects from climate change is that these are not new health challenges but they'll all be exacerbated. So it's important to know what your baseline health status is. So I just pulled a few for Hazelcrest and Broadview, um, and you can see that the emergency department visit rate for asthma for children and adults is relatively high in Hazelcrest, and the mental health emergency department visit is relatively high in Broadview. And so what can we do about it? I'm sure you're familiar with all of these strategies. I wanna point out all the different co-benefits. And so I leave you with this. If you're thinking about including all of these uh, strategies, I encourage you to explore and promote all the health, the health co-benefits from these strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. Powerful information and certainly appreciated. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, our third of our fourth speakers, is Katrina Thompson, the Honorable Mayor of the Village of Broadview, Illinois. Mayor Thompson was elected 
as mayor on April 14th, 2017. She is the first African-American woman to hold the office. She previously served as executive director of the West Humboldt Park Development Council and the executive director of the Broadview Park District. Mayor Thompson was born in Inglewood, California. She holds a master's degree from Roosevelt University and a bachelor's degree from Concordia University. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Thompson. And Mayor Thompson, this is Ned jumping in really quickly. I put a survey on screen that uh, I'll invite people to participate in um, while you're good. My apologies, Dr. Gardner. No worries, no worries. So I'll, I'll leave that up. People can participate in that at their own leisure and I'll turn it over to Mayor Thompson just now. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Burns. And I want to just say thank you to all those that's on this um, this webinar. I think it's important that we have these discussions as it re relates to the climate risk and the vulnerability that impacts our community. So to all the experts that's on the panel, I truly appreciate you all participating because I'm actually getting some, some useful information as well. So I'm going to start off. We are a very small community, about maybe a little bit under 8,000 residents. It's a good mix. 82% of our residents are African American. And when we talk about these issues that impact our community as it relates to air pollution and asthma and respiratory health, we know that the climate, um, that's a big part of all of this. And we just want to just make sure that we are proactive in the services that we deliver to our constituents every single day as it relates. So according to the disease control and prevention, one in three, one in 13 people have asthma. African-Americans in the U.S. die from asthma at a higher rate than people of other races. And so that's near and dear to, to me only because if you look at the, the bottom picture with the young girl that's in the hospital bed, that's actually a relative of mine. She died at 10 years old of an asthma attack. And so I became very compassionate toward that need because I was aware of the respiratory as it relates to asthma, but I didn't know the impact that the community have in the environment, the role that it plays when we address these types of issues. And so I wanted to just share with you all that we know that um, with, the number, with the research that we've done in our family as it relates to this, we wanna make sure that we have open space. And one thing that we know that's for sure and for certain we know we need the air to breathe, but we can't see it. And when you can't see something, that makes it that much harder for people to get on board to advocate for the services that we that we need. I'm a huge uh, component of the for those early childhood. So I like to start with the youth. That's the zero to five. And because we know prenatal and all of that that impacts our community, that's a huge component of the well-being of the mother and the prenatal and the community and the, and the environment that we're in. And as Mayor Asbury has stated, with the flooding, all of that is a direct impact because when we have the floodings that come into our homes, what happens is when it dries out, we leave the mold and the, um, the allergens that causes a lot of these issues. So every day, 10 Americans die from asthma. And in 2017, 3,564 people die from asthma. Many of these deaths were avoidable with proper treatment and care. And so when we don't have the healthcare system that, in, that, um, that can help us resolve a lot of these issues, we have to learn how to advocate for ourselves and for the people that's in our community. And I'm here to be that advocate, to be that voice as it relates to youth and air pollution and the asthma respiratory health for young people. So when we look at the kids, we see the kids playing out in the park. We want to make sure that our parks are healthy and conducive and they have the open space. And our community is so small, we are actually landlocked. So we cannot um, even put in any more open space, but we have to utilize the space that we do have in the park system. So that brings me to the social cohesion. And that's in Beldelli. I mean, he stated so so beautiful by saying that it's ordinary people that makes the work a special place. And to be an elected official, the work will never be done, but it takes all of us to advocate for a cause. And I'm passionate about the environment. Not, I mean, I'm not the expert on the high level scale of it, but on the local 
scale on what I can interpret and, and, and articulate that to the community when we talk about how we educate our community to get behind a cause to protect them. That's safe drinking water, making sure that we put our best foot forward to create initiatives like the Green Alley initiatives. We actually implemented a couple of alleys that's, a, um, that's green initiatives. We've actually, the building that I'm sitting in, when I first got here, it was molded and the employees worked in a facility like this and when we had the opportunity to enhance our police station we enhanced the administration side as well making it more um, conducive and more environmental safe for us to be in this this building and on the advocate side we need leaders to step up to the plate and paint the big picture so people can articulate that but we have to do it in small bite size and as it relates to the sustainability so when we look at revenue and resources and those types of things, we look at those things that we can immediately put things in. And I think what happens is the residents can really get on board when we say we put in a green alley because they see it from an infrastructure problem. They got potholes, the alleys are not in good conditions, but if we put in the best type of material to prevent flooding, the green, the green alleys allow us to do that. And so we look forward to the uh, mayor's metropolitan caucus to you know, give us ideas and solutions on ways that we can entertain grants that give us that opportunity. And I know that they were a big component of the MWRD for us to have that green infrastructure. Uh, the building that I'm actually sitting in is an energy efficient building. And so when you talk about those types of things, those are things that's impactful to a community, but you have to educate the community. So when I look at the picture with the boardroom being packed with uh, resident, Actually, that was a meeting to give information so people have access to resources. We don't, when we don't give the information for them to have the resources, they don't know what to do. And then they just think that we're just spending, not in their best interest as it relates to health. And health is a big component in the African-American community. We are plagued with many health issues, underlying conditions that's, um, that's detrimental to us. And so how do we get good implementation and how do we move the needle just a little bit forward? We have to learn to embrace our community and be connected to the community. And we've actually started ours with the hashtag Broadview Strong, because when people can align themselves with something that's meaningful, they tend to get on board with the initiative that go with that. So if we're saying we're Broadview Strong, that means we're strong enough to come back any underlying conditions that may happen as it relates to the climate. We are more active in our recyclables. We are more active of looking at energy efficiency. We are in clean energy. We are more efficient on how we look to do infrastructure. And we know with building infrastructure, you know, when we get the floods, those are the things that people don't see. You get the floods, it dries up, the water recedes, and now we have this cleanup, but the mold is actually building up. And you have young people and seniors that have, you know, issues with their respiratory. They don't know where it's coming from, but they forgot about the flood because they thought they just did the cleanup, but it's actually embedded because the water has dried up into the drywall. And that's something that we don't think about. And we have to keep the seniors healthy and we have to keep our young kids healthy. So I want to talk a few minutes about recreation for all because that's truly my passion. As it relates to the recreation and the climate and being vulnerable, we have to make sure that we have open space that's available for young people to participate. And it's not just for the young people, it's for everyone to enjoy a quality life while they're living on this earth. And it's our responsibility to make sure that we create good laws and good legislation that protects them. So it's us as the local leaders that can implement things when we get new building um, structures in town. You know, we need to see, you know, how is how do we remedy the flood? You know, what's the plan? We need to look at the plans and make sure that we can support those plans when new developments come in our town that can prevent flooding in other areas that the water just moved because water, when it lands, it just, it has, it has somewhere to go. And sometimes that water is in your backyard and it's, you know, and it become a mini lake and some in many backyards. And so it's our responsibility to make sure that we are doing our due diligence to make sure that it's safe drinking water, infrastructure is in place, but it's also our responsibility to talk about the environment and the climate that impacts everything as it relates to the young people and our seniors in our respiratory because the air, we can't see it, 
but we know we need it. And we need to continue with that message. So I'm happy to participate on, on this particular webinar. And we just got to get the work done. It, it takes all of us to get this work done. It's not just one person. It really takes all of us and the experts. I know uh, many times it's high level conversation. And for me, if it could just be broken down in layman terms, it's easy for me to have that conversation with the residents where it's something that they can digest and, and see it immediately. With the school kids, we need to start talking about environmental issues in the school because one thing that we know is the children, whatever they learn at school, they go home and they talk to their parents about it. And the parents may not have the information, but guess what? The parents are listening to them. So the kids sometimes become the teachers too. So we need to be you know, impactful to them to make sure that they have the resources to take back home to help us. So with that, I appreciate being on the call and I just look forward to working with the group and seeing how we can make an impact because that's what we want to do. We want to impact, we want to impact our communities. So thank you. Awesome, thank you very, very much. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Gardner who I believe has a Mentimeter question to ask. Hi everybody, I'm back. Thanks for uh, your responses on the survey so far. We can see that uh, that last question did solicit about 24 responses and people are really concerned about heart disease. Maybe at the end we'll have um, Ms. Grossman um, respond to that, give us a little insight into public health threats in the region. So um, we have two questions that Mayor Thompson wanted to ask. And uh, we put these in survey form. So we're asking about who are the worst polluters? And I'll remind folks that a uh, big part of the effort of this climate adaptation plan included addressing greenhouse gas pollution in particular, so mitigation. And um, that work is uh, well underway and been documented and we shared it in the first webinar. So if folks are interested in some of the sources of pollution we definitely have some data for you um, and you can go back and watch that first webinar to get a few more insights. Maybe we'll have some comments on this slide toward the end. And then one last question from Mayor Thompson. She was wondering how people are feeling about the future. Knowing what you know about the environment, how would you describe the future, your future? And uh, this is indeed an interesting question. I'm gonna let that one run while we come back to the panel and continue the expert commentary. So um, Mayor Burns, please back to you. Thanks very much, doctor. I misspoke earlier, folks. I said there were four panelists. There's actually five. Mr. Sean O'Dell is our fourth speaker. Mr. O'Dell is the vice president of Baxter Woodman's Water and excuse me, Water and Wastewater Group, which provides services for water utilities, and he's also the regional manager. He serves as regional director for the American Public Works Association, covering the upper Midwest and Ontario. He has previously served as president of the Chicago Metro chapter of the American Public Works Association, and he's on the board of the Illinois Public Service Institute. He earned his engineering degree from beautiful Bradley University in Peoria, Illinois, and is a professional engineer. With that, Sean, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Burns. How is everyone? Good afternoon. Thanks for holding on tight. All right, now it's time for the engineer to talk. Sorry, everybody. Um, I'll try to keep it light and not get too technical for you, uh, Mayor Thompson. But um, yeah, thank you all for the opportunity to come speak to you today. Uh, I'll be targeting on uh, Public Works Operations Infrastructure in Relation to Climate Risk and Vulnerability and Climate Change. So let's get right into it. All right, uh, Public Works Challenges. Uh, yeah, just a very good segue. Uh, nice, nice job, everybody. Um, yeah, there's a lot of challenges that us in Public Works are dealing with on a daily basis. Here are just four quick ones. There's about 200 others, but um, Climate change really is increasing the number and severity of public works emergencies. Just like we heard from Mayor Ellsbury, the amount of flooding, the increased uh, um, severity, and the number is just really, really a tough, tough um, situation for all of our communities. So we're definitely seeing that on the public works side for sure. And that is going to the number two, which is our the increased pressure on public works staff, our equipment, our infrastructure, and our systems. Um, as you might imagine, as more of these fires come up, 
uh, there's more and more pressure on our staff. And you, you couple that with our aging infrastructure, we have a lot of old pipes and pumps and, um, and roadways uh, in, in the Chicagoland area. And that's aging, and we're really not replacing rehabbing as much as we should. So that's aging, along with our workforce. Um, a lot of our baby boomers are getting close to retirement, and there really isn't quite that workforce coming behind them. And then you couple that with a lot of unfunded regulatory mandates um, from all different angles, whether it's potable water, wastewater, stormwater, um, there's a lot of different things out there. And these are just a couple of the challenges, plus COVID and everything else going on right now. So um, with all that kind of back there, a lot of us can kind of get overwhelmed about the uncertainty, but just to let you know, um, public works, we love to adapt. We solve problems constantly and we will keep you safe, whether it's drinking water or other things. So um, with that kind of broad basic um, start, let's get into the three different things I'd like to talk about today is where is public works today in relation uh, to climate change, sustainability, um, and uh, uh, all those fun topics. Uh, number two is where will public works be tomorrow? Um, looking at from a more proactive, optimistic perspective, where can we be? And then finally, what actions can we all take today? I'm a big practical execute, let's take action. So I'll finish off with, with that for everybody today. So first, where is public works today? Uh, right now, I, I'd like, I, I wish we could say we we're on the more proactive side of, uh, of the pendulum, but right now we really are reactive. Um, infrastructure is old. There's a lot of squeaky wheels. There's a, a lot of um, a lot of daily challenges that have to get addressed. And if a public works staff has 10 people, I bet you eight of those people are dealing with constant things going on throughout the day. They're not doing what what they feel like they need to be. They are constantly um, changing to, to different things. And as we all know, if we have a reactive day at our own jobs, it's usually a really a really difficult one. So trying to be more proactive in the future will be one of the keys we'll be looking to to do. Um, item two is improving communications and man managing expectations. Uh, with the Amazons of the world and social media, um, our customers are expecting immediate communication and feedback and expecting water main breaks to be fixed immediately. There's a really difficult place for us right now in public works to, to, to manage those expectations because drinking water is not an immediate thing. It takes a lot of planning, foresight, and operations to get to that point. Or when floods happen, the pipes can only take so much um, so there's it's very difficult to play that but we are getting better at that um, item three is making energy efficiency a priority we are taking more um, action with that we see a lot of performance contracts a lot of comment um, energy grant grant applications blower replacements led water meter replacements there is a, a very good improvement there but there's still a way to go um, risk resilience vulnerability are making a comeback after 9-11, there was a big push for vulnerability of water systems, and then it just kind of was quiet for a long time. And now it's coming back with the AWIA regulations and requirements. Maybe we're not doing it for the right reasons, but I think with the current environment of COVID, we are very thankful for doing those plans and having a better response to when um, bad things happen. Um, and finally, rates and affordability. Uh, again, there's a lot of needs. Being in the reactive mode, there is a lot of projects and different things need to get done. And our rates in most cases are just not there. They have to be higher to pay for these increased um, infrastructure improvements and investments. But if you increase rates, then the affordability side comes off, off kilter. So there's a lot of discussions happening with that and we, we appreciate that. We just need all of your support along with having those conversations to show the value of water and other utilities to our homeowners. So, just a lot of times that can be a little daunting what's going on today, but let's look at what we can do tomorrow. I'm a pretty optimistic guy and I, um, I, I pushed the challenging button on that last um, topic because I really think uh, from an engineering perspective and public works, um, there's always gonna be problems. Um, we just have to take one by one, start making solutions and making, making everything better. So hopefully with the right amount of resources and planning, we can swing from the reactive mode to the proactive mode where our operators are not constantly fighting fires and fixing the next water main, water main break. Maybe instead of 10 water main breaks per year, there's one. And the rest of the time they're spending it on actually thinking big picture about how can I improve operations and reduce energy efficiency and, and increase um, water accountability, all those fun things. So going into more proactive mode really goes a big way. 
So, and that was in item number two, which is the comprehensive planning and prioritization. Speaking for our members, we have a lot of water master plans and wastewater plans and stormwater plans. And then if you put them all together, it's like, oh, I have $400 million worth of improvements and I need to help prioritize. So comprehensive planning and looking across all different topics is gonna to be very important moving forward because we cannot possibly pay $100 million for lead water service replacements on the private side and pay $100 million for stormwater improvements because of all the flooding. It's just impossible. So that better planning from the higher level, which uh, we'll hear more about after my presentation is very helpful. Um, improved asset management and assessment. Um, most communities are not replacing, rehabilitating um, nearly enough infrastructure on a regular basis. Um, but part of that is they just don't know where to start because there's so many different things going on in their community. Um, and a lot of times say they've got a regular one mile of waterman that they're replacing each year. Um, maybe only half of that actually need to be replaced. If there's a better assessment tool and you can actually target what you're replacing and when, then you can better allocate those resources. So a lot of times it's a little more money up front for evaluation and planning, but then you spend money on, save money on the back end. So that whole asset management assessment, knowing what age everything is and where it's at, and it's all mapped in GIS and asset management is gonna be very important moving forward. Uh, next is regionalization of utilities. Again, having a lot of small utilities all paying very large upfront costs just to have a water system versus having larger regionalization. I think that's gonna be the wave of the future. Um, if, if you look at other parts of the country, they're going that way. And if you look at our best run utilities in the area, they're usually larger because they have more resources. So I, I really see a lot of more of that coming up in the future. Uh, Data-driven decisions. So there's so much data coming at us, whether it's again GIS, asset management, work orders, social media and, and water data, from SCADA, there's oodles of data. Most of us don't have the right amount of brain power or um, analysts on staff to help with those decisions. So better making better real-time decisions. So if you're less reactive and more proactive and have data in front of you, you can make better decisions. So I see more of that com coming up, along with automation and improved operations, the second to last bullet. Uh, automation has been out there forever, but um, if an operator is taking two hours a day just to drive to a site and then drive back and type it in, into Excel, that is not time well spent. That should be automated and they can spend two hours thinking about improving their process and making things more safe and less vulnerable. There are ways of doing this that's out there and we're going to that direction in all of our um, communities. And lastly, quicker to innovate. Um, speaking for someone that likes to innovate, I, I was really big on pushing water main lining about 10 years ago and everyone was telling me, oh, that's illegal. No one wants to hear water main lining. But Chicago, we, we are late to innovate. Um, a lot of our utilities don't want to try something until it's been on the ground for 10 years by their neighbor. We have to be quicker. Like with technology and our cell phones, we're seeing things are happening quicker. We have to try quicker things. Um, and, and not to mention with those innovations, whether it's water main lining, saving trees. We all know the importance of keeping trees. Why are we cutting down trees for water main replacements? There has to be ways of, of, of innovating better to, to help the overall system. So we're all quite there. So finally, let's talk about call to action. All right, uh, so uh, this is kind of like my little outline of like who's responsible for what, so please bear with me. But uh, the first one, and thank you for helping me proceed, is regional planners, which you'll hear about later uh, from um, Brandon, but uh, arm us with data, benefits, co-benefits. I love to hear about co-benefits, thank you. Um, Elena, um, and comprehensive plans. We need that data and that improvement to help our next our next um, one, which is um, elected officials. Uh, we have to help them set the prior, our mayors, we really need you to set the priorities and give the resources. Um, our directors of public works and our engineers, we will do whatever you tell us. If you say, this is a priority, I want you to look at all of our infrastructure projects and make sure they're all, all ready for climate mitigation um, and we'll really give you lots of resources then that will that will happen so we really need you to um to help us with that um, next is uh public works so again we we will listen to our leaders we we are we're always there so things happen we listen and then we execute so if you need us there tomorrow to do this special thing we're there so if you tell us climate change and energy efficiency and sustainability is important then we will make that happen so just know we're ready to, to execute whatever you guys tell us to do. 
Uh, next is engineers, which is kind of my forte, but we are there to um, help promote and innovate those solutions. Uh, too often we just hear, okay, you want this project, we'll do that for you, versus, hey, okay, this is what you want, but let's do this and let's look at this and how does that affect this? What's the negative externality? So coming up with those innovative solutions is very important for us. Um, and next is our innovators and in, in venture capital folks. Again, there's a really big water hub here in, in Chicago and Illinois. They have to do, we really need them to invest in sustainable technology, bring those ideas to all of these levels. A lot of times I feel like it's just the engineers speaking up for this stuff, but we need all levels to listen and learn and, and bring those to the forefront. Uh, next is regulators. Uh, uh, speaking for engineers, public work staff, there's always the fun back and forth reg with regulators, but they just have to help understand the, conf the conflict of priorities. Um, again, uh, me at the city of Elmhurst or whatever village, I can't spend two million, two hundred million dollars here and four hundred million dollars here and thirty million dollars here all next year because of this one regulation. It's just not feasible. So we have to work together. And finally, everyone. Um, this is not only in public works, but it's also just for the, the world we live in today, is we all have to better educate ourselves. Um, none of us are experts in everything, um, and we need to learn to listen, to educate, and then ultimately educate and communicate with the public, because they won't pay for these extra things, all these niceties, if their water is dirty and we're not selling them the value. So we have to, to, to educate them on the value of water, public safety, and what we do. I think we'll be able to take the next step of actually going above and beyond being proactive and helping with climate change. So that's all I got. Thank you for the opportunity. Mayor Burns. Oh, Brian. I think you're on mute, Edith. Sorry about that. Um, I'm Edith Macker, and I'm taking over for Mayor Burns, who um, had to step away, um, but uh, so I'll just take over moderating. Um, before we bring up um, Brian, uh, Ned, do we have any Menti response we want to? No, we'll come back to that after we'll Brian's talk. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, um, Brian Daly, to be a part of this panel. Uh, you may know the Mayor's Caucus and CMAP share offices, but we miss each other um, being uh, working from home here, but um, Brian Daly is a, a senior planner at CMAP and of course the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning um, is a valuable partner in this regional climate uh, planning process. Um, Brian is senior planner at, at CMAP um, and in partnership with the American Planning Association, he managed a project to integrate climate science into local planning, piloting an approach to uh, conducting climate vulnerability assessments in five communities and creating a guidebook for local planners. Um, he'll be talking about that project. Brian received a master's in city planning um, from Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a BA in religious studies um, from Middlebury College. And we're happy uh, that he had this project to relate to uh, the work that we're doing with NOAA on the Steps to Resilience. So thanks for joining us, Brian. Thank you very much, Edith. I'm happy to be here. Uh, so as Edith said, I'll be talking about uh, some tools that CMAP has developed that planners can use to assess climate vulnerability at the local level, as well as a framework that we developed to use those tools for local vulnerability assessments that can be worked into regular planning processes. Uh, so CMAP covers the seven county region in northeastern Illinois. We're the official regional planning agency there. Uh, that includes 284 municipalities and 8.5 million residents. Our work on climate and other areas is governed by ONTO 2050, which is the long range regional plan uh, that looks at strategies that the region needs to have in place by the year 2050. Uh, in keeping with the overarching theme of the plan of resilience, ONTO 2050 is the first CMAP long-range plan to go deep into climate resilience as a topic. It includes strategies for mitigating climate change as well as planning for climate resilience. Uh, in addition to the strategies that are in the plan itself, uh, there's also a climate resilience strategy paper that was developed that goes a little bit deeper into some of those topics. Um, and I would encourage you all to uh, take a look at those resources if you can. 
So the specific project I'll be talking about today was a, a three-year project that we worked on with the American Planning Association and the Illinois State Water Survey, uh, the Office of the State Climatologist, under a grant from NOAA. Uh, the project aims to integrate climate science and data into the practice of community planning. Uh, so it's less about the physical actions of adaptation and more about seeing what climate science is out there and is available uh, for planners to consult today and how can we integrate that kind of knowledge into the kinds of plans and processes that municipalities and counties are already uh, doing. Uh, so rather than looking at kind of standalone climate adaptation plans, instead this looks at how we can integrate the climate science that's out there and the data sources that are available into local comprehensive plans, corridor plans, downtown plans, and things like that. The, the core of the the project uh, that CMAP worked on um, was the development of four uh, vulnerability assessments. Uh, we did these with projects that were part of our local technical assistance portfolio, which is a program that CMAP runs uh, to work with communities in our region uh, to provide technical assistance on local plans. Uh, so we worked with four municipalities, uh, well, three municipalities in one county, actually. Uh, it was the city of Berwyn, the city of Des Plaines, the city of Wilmington, and then uh, we are working with, uh, with McHenry County on a corridor plan along a section of the Fox River. For each of these communities, we completed a climate vulnerability assessment that informed an ongoing broader planning project. And this slide kind of breaks down what went into each of those vulnerability assessments. Uh, there was a section on climate and, climate and natural hazards that drew on historic records as well as tools made available by agencies like NOAA to, uh, to see what kinds of natural hazards are present in these communities already and how those might be affected by the effects of climate change. Uh, and then the, the real crux of the assessment was the vulnerability and risk assessment, which we broke down into looking at uh, impacts on critical infrastructure, social vulnerability, and economic impacts. And I'll, I'll pause here just to, to note that, um, you know, as many people have said, there is no such thing as a natural disaster. So while we're looking at climate related hazards, uh, vulnerability, preparedness, and response are all influenced by not just the natural environment, but also social and political factors. And that's why social vulnerability, as the earlier speakers uh, have, have talked about at length, uh, is really important part of this. So, um, so we look at demographics, we look at characteristics of the built environment. Uh, one of the general findings of CMAP's research in this area is that populations that are vulnerable to climate impacts are geographically concentrated, and that those households are broadly vulnerable to many natural, social, and economic hazards. So when we discuss the areas that are vulnerable to climate risk, those are often the same people who are vulnerable to racism, to things like coronavirus, and to a general lack of public and private investment, which I think makes this work uh, really urgent and timely. So one thing, uh, as we've talked about uh, earlier today, is uh, looking at flooding. Uh, we expect the region's climate to become warmer, wetter, and more variable. And in terms of precipitation, uh, the increase is likely to be concentrated into frequent intense storms, which carry the risk of flash flooding. Historically, planners have been focused on larger scale flooding along rivers. Um, and that's been regulated through floodplain regulations uh, in delineated floodplains. Uh, and perhaps in part because of the effectiveness of floodplain regulations, we're seeing the damages from those areas representing a smaller portion of overall impacts from flooding. So this is a map that shows an analysis over a 13 year period of payouts from a, a few different uh, flood insurance programs uh, and where those payouts were highest. And this is out, outside of the 100 year floodplain uh, included 70% of those payouts. Uh, so Increasing rainfall combined with land use change and development uh, have amplified the impact of urban flooding outside of floodplains uh, as delineated by the official floodplain maps. Uh, to better understand this, CMAP developed a flood susceptibility index. Um, and basically, without going you know, too deep into the technical details, we looked at places where flood damages have taken place in the past try to understand what the characteristics of those areas were in terms of sewer coverage, elevation, 
uh, what kind of land cover there uh, is there, like impervious cover versus uh, natural areas, the age of development, and how much precipitation these areas received. And we said, uh, we looked at where flooding had taken place, looked at the characteristics of those areas, and then tried to identify other areas in the region that have similar characteristics. Um, so th that generated this map. The darker areas are the areas that are uh, relatively, uh, they have relatively higher susceptibility to urban flooding. Um, and uh, if you if you look at this, it tends to be the more urbanized areas that have higher exposure to flooding. Uh, you can see the area of um, the south side of Chicago and the south suburbs of Chicago are uh, especially susceptible, but there's areas of susceptibility throughout the region. For the vul vulnerability analyses themselves, uh, we brought that analysis down to the local level. Um, so looking at the, uh, this is the downtown Wilmington plan, and we just looked at where the relatively higher flood susceptibility areas within the community would be. And on this map, those would be the areas in orange or red. Uh, this isn't meant to replace more technical floodplain mapping. It's more just to give an idea, a general idea of what areas within a planning study uh, might have higher flood susceptibility. We can't say with certainty uh, how much flooding will occur due to climate change or exactly where that flooding will be, uh, but we can say that certain areas are more susceptible to flooding in general and that increased precipitation means that they will likely experience more flooding events in the future. Uh, so just looking at the relative exposure and relative vulnerability across uh, across your community is a good way to think about where priority investments in stormwater infrastructure should take place. Uh, another impact is is heat. Uh, and this is a, a zoomed in version of that uh, sort of urban heat island effect map that, uh, that Ned and Jim showed in their slides earlier today. Um, impervious surfaces, including roads, parking lots, and rooftops, heat up during the day and remain warm long into the night. In Northeastern Illinois, areas with greater than 50% impervious coverage have been found to be five to six degrees warmer than the regional average. Uh, so there's a really big local difference in temperature based on imperviousness, and this map uh, shows in the city of Des Plaines where those areas of higher temperature are located. Like with flooding, we can't say exactly where or exactly how hot it's going to be, uh, but we can see which areas are relatively more vulnerable to heat. Uh, this analysis can help guide the installation of green infrastructure, street trees, uh, as well as guiding things like outreach to vulnerable households to connect them with cooling centers that the city might operate in times of heat wave. And uh, to look a little bit at the, the social vulnerability, uh, we overlaid some of these maps of flooding and heat vulnerability with a map of what we call economically disconnected areas. This was an analysis that we did as part of developing the ONTU 2050 plan uh, to try to see where the spatial patterns of vulnerable populations and households were. So um, the, the sort of long and short of it is that we looked at a lot of different factors and found that uh, mapping areas that have a concentration of lower income households and either households with limited English proficiency or persons of color uh, tends to be correlated with uh, negative outcomes across a variety of indicators. So we use that one data set as sort of a broad look at where concentrations of vulnerable households are located. So here's a map showing uh, flood susceptibility. That's the, the color scale there. And then the hatched areas are the economically disconnected areas. And the idea here is just to find out, okay, so among the high, uh, highly exposed, the areas that are highly exposed to flooding, uh, where are the households located that are going to feel that most acutely? Uh, which again, is just a way to help communities prioritize the kinds of investments they're going to be making. Uh, one other way we look at social vulnerability was looking at characteristics of the built environment. Uh, so this is an example where we looked at uh, how basements are used. Uh, in if a characteristic of urban flooding is a lot of basement backups or seepage into basements, that's going to be uh, have a bigger effect on uh, households that use that basement as living space, either as an apartment or uh, a, rec re a rec room or something like that. So uh, this is a map looking at 
uh, across a community where basements uh, were being used as living space. This was a community that had pretty uniform exposure to flooding, uh, so we just wanted to look at where basements are being used as living space combined with that economically disconnected areas uh, overlay. So we do have a guidebook that's available that you can look at uh, to, to see, um, this kind of walks you through the process of using some of these data sources. In addition to these data sources, uh, there are, you may have local data that gets into greater detail. We always encourage people to use that. Uh, we were looking regionally, so we focused on some of CMAP's data sources, but this book kind of guides you through uh, whatever sources you're using, how you put that in a, a, the framework of a local plan. And I know we're, uh, we're Getting close to the end here, so I do want to just plug one other resource before uh, we finish. Um, CMAP created a water demand forecast. This wasn't available at the time we were working on these vulnerability assessments, so it didn't uh, go into those. Um, but this just looks at the various water sources, uh, drinking water sources that communities across the region use, and looked out to the year 2050, uh, what the projected changes in water demand might be. Uh, this is something that's available for 240 of the municipalities within our region. Uh, this is all available on our website. Um, so I would just uh, encourage you to look at this. There's also some guidance available on how you can use this kind of information. Uh, but looking towards the future and uh, looking towards our region's climate future, we are anticipating periods of drought and periods of hot weather. Uh, so uh, looking at the stability of your water supply is, is going to be a big part of climate planning as well. These resources are all available on CMAP's website. Um, the data hub, which is the second link here, is where you can find the flood susceptibility index, the land surface temperature maps, and the water demand forecast. Um, so I would encourage you to, to please take a look at that and to reach out to us with any questions you have. We'd like to help our partners make use of this data and we're always happy to, to sort of walk you through it. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Brian. And again, I'm taking over for Mayor Burns. Um, I do have a question uh, for uh, Jim Fox. So Jim, if you wanna pop back on camera. Um, the question is, um, appreciate the clarity and simplicity of your presentation. Uh, can you speak to the use of exposure, sensitivity, vulnerability, and risks on a time scale, especially protecting future generations? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, obviously, we are experiencing one set of uh, rule sets for sensitivity and adaptive capacity today. We are going to be looking at that having to change as the climate is changing. In other words, we might be uh, crossing critical thresholds. And so it's always important to be asking the climate question based on today's vulnerability and risk and well-crafted scenarios of the future um, in your planning horizons. And so if you're putting together a comprehensive plan or something like that on a 20 or 30 year planning horizon, you know, what are going to be the changes, not only climate, but also non-climate stressors as well too. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Ned, can I um, turn it back over to you? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> today we've been focusing on the vulnerability component of assessing vulnerability and risk. And um, I want to take a few moments to review some of the feedback we've been hearing from folks and maybe ask a few follow-up questions from our, um, from our panel. So um, I see the majority of people are seeing the future as challenging. Um, I certainly see it that way and um, wanted to give Mayor Thompson an opportunity to reflect on, on both this set of answers and um, the issue of pollution and see if, if you wanted to um, add any of your own perspective in, in say a minute or less because we've got a few questions to get through here. So the first one, who are the worst polluters? I would have to say I would agree with that because as we look at the industrious industrial areas as it relates to manufacturing and the chemicals and stuff that they use, uh, most certainly that's an impact in uh, as being a polluter because it's air. And those are things we can't see in the environment. When those pollutants get into the air, it trickles down into the community. And we don't know that they exist, which cause a lot of health issues. 
And then the second question was, if you want to take me to the next question, um, the current about the environment, how would you describe? I would say it is very challenging because when we talk about educating um, the community on these type of environmental issues is, is very complicated. And sometimes it's hard to digest the issue. So when we talk about flooding, we know it exists, but most the average resident don't understand how sewer backup and um, aging infrastructure, they don't understand that conversation. So you really have to educate them on aging infrastructure, air pollutants, recycling. So it's just more work for us to do, but it's work that has to be done. So I would agree that um, looking at the numbers that it is, it is very, very challenging. Well, as far as meeting that challenge, um, Sean, you spoke and you threw out a tantalizing nugget that I had to respond to. Um, you said you sure were glad that you had done some proactive looking at vulnerability and risk given the current COVID situation. Would you like to embellish on that at all? Yes. Uh, so as part of the current vulnerability assessments that we're doing for a lot of communities and hearing from other of our members is cybersecurity is a big aspect of it. So once you start opening the door to cybersecurity, you take a look at your IT. And when you take a look at IT, you start talking about VPN and how do you remote access to different uh, parts of your system. So once you op we opened up that um, that bag, we realized there's a lot of challenges there, and we got through some of that for a lot of our communities before this happened. And for those of you that did not go through it, they have now gone through it since. So um, it's a very good exercise. Interesting answer. I wasn't expecting that. That's very interesting, though. Planning ahead pays off in ways we don't expect. I wanted to give um, Elena an opportunity to respond to this uh, health burden question, uh, if you'd like to take a, a moment briefly to respond to the answers we got here. Yeah, it's not terribly surprising that heart disease is um, thought of as the biggest health burden because it is still the number one killer uh, in the United States, in Illinois, in Cook County. And I selected these particular um, these particular diseases and, and um, problems because they will be heavily impacted by heat, by air pollution, by um, any of the natural disasters, and and it's and I wanted to highlight that um, when thinking for communities that when thinking about how to address the health effects in their community, to understand where is the community currently at, what's the baseline, what's the priority, um, and uh, yeah, again, I, I I think it's important that. Um, those are taken into consideration for move, in moving forward. Excellent. Well, we are um, coming down to the bot, the to the 2:30 hour here, so I'm going to power through just a few closing thoughts. Um, I want to emphasize that we've we've already got a risk assessment that we've um, moved into this process with, and I think today I've heard such a great. Um, diversity of perspectives around how to evaluate um, vulnerability and risk that we'll incorporate into the climate action plan. And we'll be using the steps to resilience in subsequent um, weeks here. Next week, we'll be looking particularly at some of the options that can be used to address um, heat as well as flooding. But moving into the prioritization phase, uh, Sean spoke about this quite at length, so did Brian. Um, but um, we'll also be able to hopefully set up the community um, and the region to do some prioritization and planning as they look toward taking action. Um, in closing my own comments, I want to um, thank all of the speakers and panel for giving us an opportunity to address mm -hmm. community concerns, particularly for people who've been underrepresented in discussions uh, all through our society, certainly when it comes to environmental issues. Um, I particularly appreciate hearing the story of people who are sometimes not in the room. So it's it's a real honor to have the mayors involved in this conversation and for me to participate in a process where we're supporting you. Uh, I belong to an, uh, 
Society of Adaptation Professionals, ASAP, the American Society of Adaptation Professionals that has its own statement on justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And in that statement, um, we have this sentence here um, representing our collective will to focus on um, diversity and inclusion and equity as we do climate adaptation planning. We know that climate adaptation is not the only by any means vehicle for addressing and redressing problems in our society, but we can certainly, by thinking in the system's perspective, begin to approach the whole problem as we um, develop the steps to resilience. It was certainly our intention that we would be able to incorporate multiple value systems and ways of understanding not just problems, but approaches to addressing those problems. So that is my um, also my personal stated commitment for uh, working with your region. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Edith to close out our panel for today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That was an excellent uh, panel. And uh, um, we are to wrap up. I just um, will invite you to join us for our last webinar, which will be an interactive one. So this is our workshop where we're really seeking your input. Um, and if you need to refresh, we have, uh, we'll have all three webinars up on our website um, and we'll send out reminders. Um, we still have a number of folks on the line and I don't want to keep them longer, but um, since we did have such, uh, I think some powerful um, a dialogue uh, or prompting dialogue, I should say, between the panelists and then some um, excellent closing comments from Ned and the Mentimeter. Would any of the panelists um, have any closing thoughts that they'd like to add? Um, feel free to come back on uh, camera or your mic and then just uh, if you have any wrap up thoughts that you wanted to, um, to share. Give that a second. And if not, then I thank everybody for participating and sharing your Friday afternoons with us. This is a very important process. Um, we, in the Chicago region, especially for, for the Mayor's Caucus and the Greenest Region Compact, we've done a lot of work on mitigation, but the adaptation um, section of the plan is very important and we really need um, the, the participation across all sectors that we've had and, and are so grateful uh, for the participation and support of both CMAP, um, the International Urban Cooperation, and um, Ned and, and Jim, including the Steps to Resilience and the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit. So thank you very much. Um, again, we will send out uh, follow-up um, links. There's a survey, and then we'll have everything on the Mayor's Caucus uh, website. So thank you so much for joining us.